Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another Science at 10. Um, they've been very successful, I gather, so far, and um, this is the last in the series, I gather, for, for a few weeks. Um, our guest today, guest speaker today, is uh, Amy Ikowitz. Amy's been leading the charge on our research related to um, nutrition and tree cover relationships. And we had a paper published uh, earlier this year looking at a very large data set, um, looking at the relationship between child nutrition and tree cover in Africa. And Amy has developed that uh, research a little bit further to look at the situation in Indonesia. The paper that has now been drafted shows some very, very um, surprising findings and some contentious findings. Uh, and I think that they'll be worthy of some discussion after she's spoken. So I'm going to hand over to, to Amy with no further ado, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming this morning. Um, I, as Terry said, I'm going to be speaking about the relationship between nutrition and tree cover and forests in Indonesia. First, I would like to say that the paper that I'm going to be talking about is joint work with Dominic Rowland, Bronwyn Powell, Agus, and uh, Terry. So he sort of should have recused himself, I would believe. But anyway, um, so first a bit of background about the situation of nutrition in Indonesia. So Indonesia has made huge strides in the last couple of decades in reducing poverty. And in the beginning of the 1990s, it also made um, pretty good steps in reducing child nutrition. But since about 2000, the situation has sort of stagnated. So uh, malnutrition rates are relatively high in Indonesia with respect, if you compare it to other countries with similar income levels. And um, about one third of children in Indonesia are stunted, which means that they are not the height that they should be for their ages. And estimates vary. Um, about how much food insecurity in terms of calorie intake there is in Indonesia, but I've seen rates from about 16% to about 36% of uh, households in, Indo in Indonesia that don't get enough food to eat. And so that's normally what people think of when they think of um, undernutrition or malnutrition, but there's another form of malnutrition that is actually more widespread, and that's not so much about the calories that people eat, but the quality of their diets. So the, um, the main indicator of that is our micronutrient deficiencies. So um, the numbers for micronutrient deficiencies amongst children, not just, sorry, the, the data that I have are not just for children, but for the whole population. Um, estimates go all the way up to 100 million Indonesians that suffer from some form of, mal of micronutrient deficiencies. So um, the most common of those are iron, vitamin A, and zinc. And so uh, micronutrient deficiencies, particularly in children, um, have very negative effects. So um, they increase uh, in people's um, susceptibility to disease because it lowers people's immunities. And it retards cognitive development of children, both in utero and then after they're born. Um, and eventually, it, in its most severe forms, can actually lead to death. So um, the picture in Indonesia, in both with respect to calorie sufficiency and micronutrient deficiencies, is, is not very pretty right now. Um, there are government programs that are trying to address this. But as I said before, com with respect to its income level, it's not, it's not, it's not doing too great. So that's the nutrition picture. Then on the other hand, um, the, we work for C4, so this talk has to do with forests and trees. So the forest picture, as all of you know, um, in Indonesia, deforestation rates are relatively high. Um, and depending on who you listen to, some of the justification, in some sense, for deforestation rates, high deforestation rates, especially amongst policymakers, is that even though it's kind of a bad thing, in some sense, it's to serve a higher purpose, and the higher purpose is food security. So we hear lots of polemics that there's food security in, in order to um, feed the increasing global population or in the particular country that you're looking to. Um, you know, we have no choice 
in order to feed people, we're going to have, we need agricultural land, and a lot of that's going to have to come at the expense of forests. So, um, in our work, as Terry mentioned before, um, a bit earlier, we've looked at the relationship between tree cover and nutrition in a large data set in Africa, and we found actually that it seems, if you're thinking about food security very broadly in terms of not just the calories that people eat, but the quality of their diets, in, um, there, we found actually positive relationships between tree cover and various indicators of dietary quality. So we were interested in, in looking at in the context of Indonesia if we would find similar relationships. So um, our basic question is to see if there's a relationship between forests and trees in Indonesia and micronutrient-rich food consumption. So we're not looking at the number of calories people consume, but the quality of their diets. So there's various reasons to hypothesize why there might be a positive relationship. And so it could be because forests provide ecosystem services for agriculture, and that makes agriculture more productive, so people have access to more food. So that's one possibility. Another possibility is that people actually directly collect wild foods from forests, and so that increases their, it, depending on the quality of those foods, so trees tend to give fruits, nuts, um, that directly might have positive impacts on people's diets. It could be because they hunt uh, bushmeat in forests, and animal source foods are actually the richest source of, of micronutrients. Um, so it's a very, very key food group. Um, and then there's also the possibility that it's not direct food, and it's not so much the, the ecosystem services of the forest, so maybe this is linked to that, but the type of agriculture that people tend to practice in areas where there's forests such as shifting cultivation and complex agroforestry systems might actually um, help diversify people's diets and give them access to more, more micronutrient-rich foods. So in order to look at this question, we combine data for um, children under five and the frequency that they ate foods from several different food groups that tend to be micronutrient-rich in the last seven days. So this is data from the demographic health surveys that are funded by USAID and done in many, many developing countries. So Indonesia had one done in 2003. So we have data from all over, well, most of Indonesia. Um, it's a representative survey, and um, they ask mothers about what their, how often their children ate from various food groups in the last seven days. So we're particularly interested in looking at those food groups that are micronutrient rich. And we combine that data with information on GIS data on tree cover. So the, the DHS provides uh, GPS coordinates for community locations, slightly jiggled a bit, um, so that you can identify the particular community. So we look at the tree cover within a five kilometer radius of a community and try to investigate using a bunch of different control variables whether there's a relationship between tree cover and consumption of micronutrient rich foods. So in doing so, we found um, that there is a positive relationship between tree cover. I should say um, that we, we restricted the sample to only rural communities and only looked at one child under five per household, per household and a child that was over 12 months so that they weren't mostly reliant on breast milk. So we found that children that live in communities where there was more tree cover um, consumed more animal source uh, foods, which as I said before is sort of the key food group in terms of providing micronutrients. They uh, consumed more vitamin A rich fruits and consumed more other fruits and vegetables. So that's kind of a vague category that the DHS incorporates foods that are not uh, orange fleshy uh, fruits or vegetables or green vegetables. So we think that that's a pretty exciting result. But as we were drafting the paper and, and talking it over, we thought that maybe we could actually, in the case of Indonesia, we might be able to do better than that and look more specifically at what kinds of trees we were looking at. So the Africa study that Terry mentioned is we only looked at tree cover. But in Indonesia, 
we were able to get uh, data from the Ministry of Forestry, which actually, actually classifies the kinds of trees um, that, we were, that we could see. So um, very recently, um, we disaggregated our tree cover uh, group to look at natural forests, uh, planted forests, plantations, so that's like a, a oil palm, rubber, coffee would be in the plantations. Um, and then they have an other category which doesn't fit into those categories. So it could be anything from you know roads, land, open, savanna, uh, bush, and key for us, mixed systems where there's trees but it doesn't fit into any of their other categories. So these are trees around communities. So we also uh, divided the trees in the other category. So these are trees around people's communities, again, into low, medium, and high. So for low, we have less than 20%. For medium, we have 20 to 50%. And for high, we have over 50%. And so we looked at the relationship between all of our food group, uh, frequency of food group consumption and the different classes of trees. And this is where things, where, where Terry was kind of trying to sell this, look some more exciting and maybe a little bit more contentious. Um, so we found that for animal source food consumption, natural forests were, had a positive and statistically significant association. So that is sort of supported our hypothesis because what we think is going on is that there's reliance on bushmeat in communities where there's forests, surrounding forests. Um, for vitamin A rich fruit consumption um, and other fruit and vegetable consumption and animal source food consumption as well, we found that the strongest association of our classes was in the medium tree cover category around people's communities. So again, that's tree cover between about 20 and 50%. So communities that live in, children that live in communities where there's about 20, between 20 and 50% tree cover seemed, um, not seemed, they consume more animal source foods, they consume more vitamin A rich fruits and more other fruits and vegetables. And then we also found a positive relationship between um, planted forests and vitamin A rich fruit consumption, meat consumption, and legume consumption. And we found a positive relationship between legume consumption and plantation, plantation forests. So, so what do we think is going on? Well, our, the nice simple story we have is for the bushmeat and the natural forests. For the other categories, it seems a bit more complex. So, what, what our intuition tells us, and it, we might be wrong and it would be nice to hear from other people and what maybe other people suspect is going on, maybe people that are more familiar with the Indonesian rural context, is that the 20 to 50 percent tree cover is really indicative of shifting cultivation and smallholder agroforestry. And so communities that live, that practice these types of agricultures seem to be um, consuming more micronutrient rich foods. For the uh, the planted forests, we think it's probably infrastructure and logging roads that's making markets, <clears throat> uh, that ha has more easier access to markets and making foods more accessible. And for the plantation forests, remember we only found one significant, statistically significant relationship for the plantation forests and that was only for legumes. We are hypothesizing that that's probably um, a cultural issue because legumes in Indonesia tend to be tofu and tempeh. And so that might be a cultural issue of uh, particularly Javanese migrants working in oil palm plantations and um, having a different cultural customs of what, of what people eat. It could also be um, connected to maybe better infrastructure at, as with the planted forest, although it would be strange that it's only showing up there. Um, okay. So in conclusion, um, we, we've we have a strong relationship between tree cover and micronutrient rich food consumption in Indonesia. And that we can assert really confidently. And then when we're looking at the particular trees that are, seem to be important for people's diets and whether, we're gonna, whether those are forests or whether those are mixed, 
multifunctional landscapes. I had to get that in. Um, those are questions that we, we, we need to explore further and we're interested in hearing from you to hear what people's ideas are for helping us to try to understand what, what our findings are. Thank you. Meg saying that was an excellent summary of the, the research. Um, I'm sure there are questions uh, from the participants here, so I open the, the floor out for, for questions for, for Amy and uh, maybe perhaps other members of the, the research team. You've wowed them, Amy. Okay, Kalina, back. I don't know if this is a question or an input, um, but there's a plan for the Indonesian government to open up uh, some forest land to become rice plantation or agricultural plantation. And this is one of the plans of the of Prabowo, or the future, one of the um, candidates for the pres presidency. I'm just curious whether there's a correlation between forest conversion to become agricultural plantations such as plant with the nutrients itself because the, um, the reason behind that is they wanted to increase the economy and also increase um, the economy of the local community so they can buy more foods and more nutrition but is this um, logical and do you have any results on that thank you I'd really like to see that speech where he says that, um, because that sort of um, epitomizes what I said in the beginning, that we often see that it, forests are pitted against food security, and that's like a really good example where, okay, you know, we know we need to conserve forests, and that's a great thing, but food security comes first. Um, <clears throat> so I didn't mention that uh, we also, um, looked at our data set to sort of verify um, that um, this is a, a result that uh, William Sunderland and others um, published earlier, uh, more broadly, but that in Indonesia, communities that live closer to more tree cover also tend to be poor, lower incomes. So that, um, so we interpret that as saying that our result is not, that it's because people are living in more treed areas that they have higher incomes and so are able to buy more foods. That doesn't, that, that's not the case. It's actually, even though they have lower incomes, they tend to be eating more micronutrient rich foods. So the example with rice is, rice is an important part of diets and it provides calories and calories are important. And as I said earlier, almost, depending on the estimates that you look at, almost 30% of households in Indonesia don't have access to sufficient calories. Although it sounds to me like that's really rice for marketing and not really necessarily for subsistence consumption in communities. So it's not clear that that would actually end up going to feed people. That would be exchanged in markets. The idea, I guess, is to increase people's incomes. And then with those higher incomes, they should be able to purchase more nutritious foods. And the data for that are not very convincing. There's the link between incomes and dietary quality is very, very weak, and it can even actually be negative. So it depends on where you are on the, say if we imagine we have very, very poor people, sort of poor people, less poor people, middle income people, and rich people, something like that. Um, <clears throat> There is, when, when you increase income at certain levels of income, your dietary quality probably goes up because sometimes people can only afford to eat rice. So as soon as people get a little bit more income and they can diversify a bit, their dietary quality will improve. But there's a huge range in which people's incomes go up and they buy food with less lower dietary quality, like fatty foods, sugary foods, processed foods. Um, so, um, if I were gonna be president, and I really wanted to address issues of malnutrition and undernutrition, I, I don't think, I, I actually, I know that wouldn't be the policy I would go for. Hi, 
Thanks, it was really interesting. And I'd like you to explain a little more about this link between um, income and dietary quality. Does it have any effect on the distance to forests? Let's say the relationship between income and dietary quality is different when you live near to the forests compared to when you're living far. That's a really great question that I can't answer. Okay. Um, at least, certainly not with this data set. Um, this data set, all in terms of community location, all we had was the GPS, one GPS coordinate for a community. So I don't know w which households are living closer and which households are living further, nor do we have that information for the other study that we mentioned. But Ronwin um, has dissertation in Tanzania, actually, she does look at a bit at, the, at that relationship, right? Do you want to say something? Stand up. Okay, so I don't know that my dissertation in Tanzania is the best example, but um, in developed countries these days, the people who are food insecure are also the most micronutrient deficient. Uh, but they also tend to have higher rates of obesity. So they're eating too many calories and not enough micronutrients. And increasingly in Indonesia and other Asian countries, we see this, it's called a double burden of malnutrition, where people are obese but anemic or obese but uh, vitamin A deficient. So providing more rice or more income, uh, that relationship is, is very tricky. My dissertation in Tanzania. Oh, forest, it's been a while. Distance to forest. Yeah. So there, there, I sampled uh, specifically to look at um, market access, which was inversely related with forest cover, and the people who were purchasing more food had much lower dietary quality, and the people who were eating more wild and forest foods had better dietary quality and, and higher micronutrient intake. So that's because. Um, choices around how to spend your money are not often, not always directed towards micronutrient rich foods. Um, and there's all this um, psychological research that shows if you give people a buffet, even 10 centimeters difference between the unhealthy food and the healthy food can make a, make a difference to which foods people choose to eat. Thanks, Amy. Very, very interesting presentation. Uh, just a quick question. What was the land cover in the places where the, the micronutrient deficiency was the greatest? Is, is it monoculture uh, uh, cereal production? Is, is, it, uh, is it a particular type of forest? Um, that's not something that we looked at. So I also, it's not, it's not quite fair to say uh, where micronutrient deficiencies were the highest because I don't have the data. So what I have are, is the frequency with which people ate from various food groups, um, some of which are more micronutrient rich. So uh, it would be a bit complicated, but I think we probably could come up with some sort of index to combine all of those and sort of have a micronutrient rich index and then look at its distribution and its relationship to land cover. That would be an interesting thing, Jim. So we haven't done that, but I think that that's something that seems like it might be interesting to do. Sorry. Thank you. Any other questions from the floor? Yes, please. Any? It's being recorded, so you have to be mic'd up. So I have two questions, and one is we know that there's a relationship between land tenure and tree planting. So, do you need me to stand up? <laughs> no, I was, just Great. I was just teasing. There's, sorry. in many places, especially Latin America where I've worked, there's a relationship between tree planting and land tenure. So I'm wondering if your da data set has anything to say about the spatial overlay between land tenure security and the kinds of tree cover that produces micronutrient-rich diets. That's a, that looks like a no. That's a definite no. It's a demographic health survey where people ask questions about, you know, Fertility, you know, it's it's very it's it's more like a population type of survey where they don't look at institutions or 
and, oh, and the that, kinds of things that social it's not really for social scientists per se. Great. So my other <laughs> question as a social scientist was, okay. what is do you have data on relative access to markets or how connected these communities are to markets? Because we also know mm -hmm. from other places that micronutrient rich foods are very expensive to replace on the market and relative mm -hmm. autonomy for markets mm -hmm. for peasant producers can actually produce better food security outcomes. Okay, so not directly. We do have, um, so because I used another uh, GIS data set, I do have, uh, I was, we were able to calculate distance to coast and distance to closest small city. Um, so that's sort of our, in our minds, a proxy for access to, to markets. Um, and sort of my intuition sort of tells me what, what I, where I think, where you're coming from, I think, um, that it might be actually a negative relationship in some sense between market access and the consumption of micronutrient rich foods. And so that's why I was a bit, <clears throat> um, surprised that we did actually find, though, a positive relationship for places that had more planted forests. And my guess is, as I said, that that's probably because of better infrastructure. So I, I wasn't expecting that we would find that, but we did. So in this case, it might be that the, the stronger relationship was still with the medium tree cover. Um, so that in terms of magnitude, that outweighed the impact of the planted forests. Um, it, there, it also might be something else going on, but with this data set, it's, it's hard to get any more precise than that, which is why we feel like these are such interesting questions, particularly in Indonesia, that um, we think that we should actually try to collect our own data to try to, try to tease out some of these things. Yeah. Ladies in front. I would, I would like to know if you have uh, more information about new open area when there is uh, some population movement. Who some what movement? Okay. Some population movement who go to live um, in new open area for work there and nearly close the forest, but we don't have the local knowledge for manage it and find the food here. If there is a link or if somebody else to do that. Are you asking when there's in-migration of people from a different community and they move to a place where there's forest? Yes. And then that they, that they don't have knowledge of the local area and the yeah, local ecology, so don't know what, what kinds of foods to eat? Yeah, I think it's, yeah. It is an interesting question. No, I, I don't, no, I don't have that data. <laughs> and I don't know how, <clears throat> I think in Indonesia, from my limited knowledge, and there's plenty of people here that can, can correct me if I'm wrong, that you don't really have people coming to a place where there is nobody already. So you do have places where there's different, you know, during the transmigrasi period, you did have different um, ethnic groups coming, but where there were already people that were living there. And they do have, it's hard to know how much of their, my guess is that they would have different dietary patterns, and some of that might be based on the knowledge of the local ecology, and some of it might also just be different cultural food dietary customs. So it would be hard to separate that out, but I think maybe it's possible and an interesting question. Can I ask a question? Do you mind? Yeah. Um, I think these, the, the, the results from the Africa study and, the, and this particular study in Indonesia are extremely compelling. I mean, the, the, the relationship between forests and nutrition is a very powerful message. And we've been, it's one of those messages we've been sort of clinging on to in terms of, you know, the impact of forests on, on the, the wider social sector that we, that we work with. But so what? I mean, what are the policy implications? Kalina alluded to the, the political intent here in Indonesia to, to work on you know, calories, basically, focus on more calorific production. Even the CG uh, head of the consortium is, is talking about to feed 9 billion people in 2050, we need more calories, more calories, more calories, and this is going to come at the expense of forests. Our results are showing, actually, for better diets, forests and forested landscapes are extremely important. How do we sort of turn things around policy-wise to actually get people to listen to this, this message? Thanks, Terry. <laughs> well, I think over the last maybe five years or so, 
I think the voices, the voices of nutritionists have become louder and people are listening more to them than they were before. When you read, you still read, you know, papers that start off with that same paragraph, you know, global population going to be 9 billion, how are we going to feed all these people, it's going to come, deforestation. You still read a bunch of those papers, but there's more and more papers, sometimes in the same journals, where people bring up issues of micronutrient deficiency, um, where um, you have like a whole movement of at least bringing nutrition, nutrition and agriculture together. Maybe not forests yet, but that's sort of, you know, that's sort of new. So um, nutritionists are talking to agricultural people and trying to think about how agriculture can be more nutrition sensitive, and then a lot of that has to do with micronutrients. So I feel like that's a step in the right direction, looking at the wider landscape and not just uh, agriculture, but looking at wild foods. I think that's just the next step. So I don't know how close we are to that, but I think we're getting closer. And I think these kinds of results and by some other people, this has become, in the last few years, become kind of a, you know, sort of hot topic, I think. They're still, it's maybe not, you know, red hot, <laughs> but it's getting hotter. I mean, Bioversity is working on similar things these days. Um, the FAO um, had a meeting on forests and food security last year. Um, in the state of the world food security issue, uh, one in 2012, they had a little blurb on forest and food security. So I think it's going to take time, but I think, I think having more actual empirical evidence can only make a stronger case. Thanks. Sorry about that. Time for one final question. No. There's no time for one final question. I've just been told there's no time for a further question. 10.35. So let me just thank you all for, for coming to another Science at 10. It was, I think it was a very interesting uh, talk and discussion. And let me thank Amy in particular for her presentation. So thank you. Thank you.